Hello and welcome to the DW Africa YouTube show. Here we talk about issues affecting African youth. My name is Wenji Komora and it is my pleasure today to welcome Patrice Drua on our YouTube channel. Now, Patrice is a woman of many hearts. Some of you may know her as a Mandela Washington Fellow, maybe a former Miss Liberia, DW Global Media Fellow, an author, a girls' education advocate, among other roles. Today, we'll be having an intimate talk with Patrice and finding out more about the impact of her advocacy work. Welcome to the show, Patrice. Thank you so much for having me, Wanjiku. It's always a pleasure working with DW. You know, I have a thing for DW. <laughs> and, and the 77 particularly have a thing for you Nearly too, the, because you're whoo. doing amazing things. Thank you so much. I love the great work you all are doing at the 77%. It's actually, you know, refreshing. Every time I need a break, I just go on YouTube and I watch all of the episodes uh. and really interesting conversations that need to be had. Guys, I have, I'm not the one who said this, so make sure you check out our YouTube channel. We have so much more. Like, the honor of having Patrice. Do you know, Patrice, you are not in Liberia right now. Where are you living in this corona time? I'm in Spain, Madrid, uh, Spain, and I've been here for almost a year uh, pursuing educational and professional development uh, opportunities. So I'm actually a student. You, you are a student right now. <laughs> student. I like, <laughs> I like that you have actually mentioned education and we will get back into that theme a little later. But um, just looking at the times we are in at the moment and how radical um, our lives have been changed. Mm -hmm. um, in West Africa, Liberia particularly, um, there was Ebola which was mm -hmm. a serious, serious, had a serious impact on the lives of people. How different is this compared to Ebola times um, in Liberia? Well, you know, I tell people that with the Ebola outbreak, you know, there were so many lessons that if the world had paid attention, could have helped us, you know, prevent Corona better. Um, because, I mean, all of the hand washing we see now, we were doing it back then in 2014, the social distancing we were doing, all of those things back then uh, is different because now the world, you know, when it was happening in West Africa, people were like, they are just a small, it's just a small, you know, a uh, portion of the world, a small part of the world, and people they didn't see how it impacted them. But now with Corona, people can see that you know, you don't invent these things. Africans don't create these things. You know, these things are natural and they occur and they can happen to anyone. Uh, the difference is I was home with family at the time and very involved in the community. Uh, but now I'm away from home. And um, the impact was really, it was something in the beginning. Is, it has felt somewhat like a deja vu for me. Uh, but all of the lessons I was able to, to take away from my Ebola experience have enabled me to thrive during this time what, and also be yeah. compassionate to others. Yeah. What particular uh, lesson do you, did you carry from that time that you're using at the moment? Well, the importance of storytelling, as you see uh, in, in my work, uh, the, a poem I wrote during that time, I was you know, using my writing and, and advocacy and voice to raise awareness, I even launched a campaign called, uh, along with other Liberian creatives and artists, called the Ebola is not my identity campaign, because we're trying to counter what was being portrayed of the region, you know, at the time on, you know, in the news. Um, so we decided to launch this campaign to add a human face to the Ebola outbreak, that they are not just people who are dying. It's not all about the deaths. It's not, it's not all about the, the stigma and stereotypes, that these are true people, true stories, um, and these people's lives are being changed and impacted. So we launched that campaign. Um, I traveled to Morocco. I spoke at schools in the U.S., uh, because, you know, it was in West Africa, but Ebola had taken the face of the entire continent, Mm -hmm. Or the, the face of the continent had, you know, was being, the whole continent was being summed up. That if you said, if you mentioned Ebola, they would just, you know, think it's the whole con continent at the time. So it was important to create the awareness abroad that it's 
it is an African problem, but it's just a small uh, part of Africa, but still people need to be enlightened and aware. Mm -hmm. There is, um, you, you've spoken about changing the narrative and I would just like to quickly read an excerpt from your book, which we'll be talking a, a little about a little bit uh, later. Um, <clears throat> the poem is called The Ebola Ride. And on this verse, you say, crowded streets create the illusion of a normal life. Mm -hmm. But as alive as everything appears from the outside, fear is killing us slowly on the inside. Sometimes we wonder who'll get off next. But that's the Ebola ride. And um, when I was reading this particular poem, it was so timely in the way that coronavirus has brought about fear and you are clearly of course speaking from your experience but also sort of speaking into the future this is exactly mm -hmm. what we are seeing happening in many parts around the world where normal life is coming back you know yes. uh, slowly people are feeling okay yeah that's all right but uh, we've seen the numbers in african countries slowly going up going up yeah what is your impression or what, what are your thoughts when you look at your work and see, oh, wow, this is exactly our reality in 2020? You're right, Wanjiko. I was just thinking about it the other day, you know, when I was, you know, taking a walk and I saw people trying to return to normal, you know, normalcy again. You remember when, when, when the corona pandemic started, people had all of these wonderful plans and people were, you know, dreaming. There was a lot of introspection, you know, about how we should change the way we live, how we should be environmentally conscious, how we should be more empathetic and all of those things. But then as you, you would watch now, we are returning to where we used to be. I'm wondering if we will still hold on to some of the lessons that we learned, you know, from that period, or we're just going to forget quickly and go back to the way things used to be. Um, so that's one of the things because we easily forget as humans, we were all very prayerful. We were all very introspective. We were compassionate. We were connecting more. We were talking more. We were seeing each other more. Uh, but as the world returns to normal, will we still see each other? Will we still talk? Will we still uh, uh, um, be careful about the, the lifestyles that we lead and, and take care of the environment? Um, so it's, it's, it's something I, I've had, I've, this period, I've been thinking a whole lot. You know, I've spent most of my time just deep in my thoughts and just, you know, staying, trying to stay positive. But it is indeed similar to, like I said earlier, to the mm -hmm. experience, uh, the Ebola experience. And I just hope we will take the lessons from this and be prepared for the future or better prepared. And change really the on the way continent. We are running things, right? Definitely, especially on the continent. You know, you know how sometimes you know we have cultural stereotypes, and people feel like, oh, these things are man-made, or they're, or they're, you know, somebody created it, or mm. because that's how it was when Ebola happened the first time. People didn't believe it initially, but it had to take several deaths for it to sink in, and we don't want that. We want to be careful when these things happen and yeah. stop, you know, and take the, pre the precautionary measures and stop, you know, doubting so much. Now, we've just briefly touched on changing how we are running things. And um, this is something that you've covered in your poetry collection titled Under the Core Skies, in which you reflect the journey, not just of change, but across lost childhood, war, caged mm -hmm. dreams, but also, and what, is, what I particularly like about your book is keeping home, hope alive. Definitely. Now, this is also reflective of your experiences growing up in Liberia. Can you share mm -hmm. with us how it was? Did you just all your life grow up in Liberia or how was it? I grew up in Liberia all my life, but there were periods when I, my family and I left and went to neighboring Cote d'Ivoire and, and we were ref, refugees there for a while. So we stayed there for about four to five years. And then we returned uh, um, to Liberia after the conflict. I was really little when the civil war in Liberia began. And as most adults you know, know or the older generation, Liberia was a very beautiful place. It still is beautiful, but it was a very beautiful and significant country on the African continent, the oldest African republic. 
Um, but due to the, the 14 years of civil war, we, we experienced a lot of young people, a whole generation, you know, was lost due to that. You had a lot, a lot of child soldiers, a lot of young people were displaced along with their families. But um, yes, I grew up during that experience and what really, you know, pushed my love for story ignited my love for storytelling was mm -hmm. um, I used storytelling and reading and books as an escape from the chaos around me. So as what, you know, what I, we you would mean? hear. Yeah. What do you mean when you say that, that you used story, uh, storytelling and reading? What was because the situation like around you? There were always, you know, gunshots, there were bullets, there, you know, you had fighters, you had people killing people, and it was, it was terrible for a young child. And so I took solace because my mother uh, was a teacher for a primary, uh, a primary school teacher, and so we always, has, we always had a lot of books at home. And so I found solace in my books. I was always reading as a form of escape just to escape the chaos that was around me. And so I developed the interest in telling my stories and, and as a way to escape uh, the reality that I was experiencing at the time. How did that yeah. experience um, of having to not only hide yourself in books, but also leave your home country and go to Ivory Coast affect you? As a child, I really, mm -hmm. I was so happy to be in Cote d'Ivoire because that was my first time seeing, a, I, when I talk about Cote d'Ivoire, I smile because I love that country so much because it, it was the first country that, you know, showed me a stable society because as a young person growing up in Liberia, I was like three, four, four years old when the war started and, you know, that's all we knew. We only knew chaos. Um, the young, the older people, you know, would talk about the Liberia that was before the war, but some mm -hmm. of us didn't get to see that. And so going to Cote d'Ivoire, I was able to see children playing again. I was able to see families being families. I was able to see young people going to school without having to run, you know, from classes wow. because of the war. Yes. Yeah. So it, it, it really provided you know, that stability that I needed. And, and it, it, would, it would always have a peaceful, uh, a precious place and a treasured place in my heart. Indeed, I have had and listened to previous interviews where you say this is your second home. Ivory Coast is your second home. And now I understand And Ghana, of course. Why. <laughs> <laughs> you, you don't want the Ghanaians to come at you, I see. <laughs> I don't want them to come at me. <laughs> but, uh, but so when you went to Ivory Coast as a young mm -hmm. child, um, and from my understanding, Liberia generally speaks English. Ivory Coast speaks mm -hmm. French. How mm -hmm. was it for you integrating into this new uh, country with a new language and with completely different uh, makeup of ethnic nations? It, there are so, the culture, you know, I tell people the entire African continent, Wanjiku, we are so similar. You know, if we could only focus on the similarities that we share, we wouldn't be so divided in other ways, you know. Um, Cote d'Ivoire is right next door. And like you said, the, Liberia is actually surrounded by two Francophone African countries, uh, Guinea and, and, and Cote d'Ivoire. So we, but we didn't speak French and I hadn't encountered the French language at such a young age. But when we got there, we, we had, they had similar, you know, food. Um, they even have some, some ethnic groups that are in Liberia present in Cote d'Ivoire. And so we were just able to, you know, get into the educational system. And as young children, you know, it's easier for children to adapt. Mm. Um, and we didn't have a choice because when you're fleeing from a conflict, you just want a place where you are safe uh, and provided all of the basic necessities that you need to survive. And so we were able to just get into that society. I, for one, had a great time and, and Cote d'Ivoire ignited my, my love for culture, you know, and and interacting with people from different backgrounds. It's actually a beautiful country. The entire African continent, I tell people, if you have the chance, mainly young people, yeah. explore it. It's so beautiful. It's so diverse. And there's just so much to learn. You make me wish yeah. that the borders would open up faster, of course, with all health safety regulations observed. But, but the, you, the way you explain it um, just shows your passion for this country. And as you were talking, 
there's one topic that we've had on this channel. We are constantly talking about it, and that is the African identity. And the question we've mm -hmm. constantly been asking is, what is an, uh, the African identity? And I would like you to answer this question because you've said that it doesn't matter where from the continent you come from, that we have so many similarities. Do you think there's an African identity? And number two, what is it? I Oh, what a question. <laughs> 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 Thank you for that question, Wanjiko. I think there is an African identity. Um, African identity comes from, you know, our shared values and experiences as a people. And you also have people who aren't Africans, but when they interact with us, when they visit the continent, they interact with us. Some people become Africans because some people become lifelong students of Africa, even if they are not Africans. Um, so the African identity is uh, uh, um, tapping into our story, owning our story, um, taking stock of where we are and forging ahead positively to redefine the narrative of our continent, but also telling our story from a place of passion and strength, not one of poverty, because Africa is not poor. When I hear people associate the, the continent of Africa with poverty, I'm always taken aback by, by it. I think we need to realize that we are a strong people. The identity of Africa is one of courage, one of strength, and one of promise. Ah, ah yeah. <laughs> If you are running for office, I would definitely vote for you. Now, I would like us to go back to your personal story. Um, so you've left uh, Cote d'Ivoire after four or five years. You've gone back mm -hmm. to Liberia. Was the war over when you went back? The war, you know, it, would, it, would, it was on and off for 14 years. So yes. during the time that my family returned, it was a bit normal. Uh, but then it, it started again. But it was stable for a while when we went back. And so I was able to get into school and uh, continue my education. It was, it, was, it was different, you know, coming back from Cote d'Ivoire with all of the stability. Obviously, you know, Liberia had destroyed most of its infrastructure at the time. And so, like, all of the, the comfort that we were used to in Cote d'Ivoire, we didn't have some of them back in Liberia. But home is always home. Once you're on your own soil and, and you're interacting with your people, mm. that's just something about being in your own country. You know, it, it makes you uh, really happy. And my family is always pro-Liberia and pro-Africa. So it was, it was refreshing being back home and contributing in our own way when, when, when to you our that, countries. When you said that your family mm -hmm. was pro-Liberia, uh, that means that you had the opportunity to go to another country and your family decided, no, 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 we're going back home? Or During the, the war, Wanjiku, there were, there were so many programs that were, you know, uh, uh, programs from the West for Liberians to travel. You have the famous uh, resettlement program. You know, a lot of Liberians relocated to the United States. Um, and, and if you wanted to go, you could pursue that and go. But my family wasn't... Uh, in pursuit of that at the time, we wanted to go back home. And so um, even before the war, Liberians traveled, but it was really because of the war that Liberia or Liberians started traveling a lot because Liberia was a little stable place as the name depicts Liberia, land of the free uh, or land of liberty. So a lot of you know, Africans who were, it, the, the country was founded for freed uh, uh, black people, black people in the diaspora, the African diaspora and black people across the continent and the world to have a safe place that they could come to. And so Liberia hosted so many people, uh, uh, even during so South Africa's apartheid uh, uh, era, we had Hugh Masekila, who sought refuge in Liberia. We had uh, the, the singer Nina Simone, who came to Liberia in the 70s, and she has so many wonderful she had so many wonderful stories to tell uh, of her experience in Liberia. So Liberia was that place that you could escape to. But then we started running to other countries during the war, and that's what conflict does. Uh, it just you know. Uh, it just destabilizes uh, a place, and, and, and it has you searching for meaning mm. and home. Mm -hmm. But then you found meaning in education after you went back to Liberia. 
education became one of the after your 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 own education of course education became mm -hmm. uh, something that you have been campaigning for how important is it for you and for the young people in liberia education i'm very passionate about education for you for young people particularly girls because my mother was a teacher for 50 years and she taught across rural liberia uh, even during the war, most of some of our students were even child soldiers during the war. And based on how compassionate she was in the classroom and some of the sacrifices that she made to educate those young people, we would uh, approach checkpoints and some of those young people she taught would have guns in, her, in their hands and they would tell them, they would tell their friends, oh, that's our teacher, teacher Martha, let her go, you know, with her children. Yeah. And so, yes, so education is very important for me because my mother laid that foundation, my family ignited that fire in me from a very young age. And I've seen how it has changed my life because I'm from rural Liberia. My family is from rural Liberia. And it, if it, it was because of the educational opportunities that we were given that has, you know, opened so many doors uh, for me and my family. Uh, and I, th I, I think that education is particularly important for young people across the continent and in Liberia, because when you have conflict, young people, like I said, need meaning and they need another tool, especially if you have, you know, former child soldiers who have been used to uh, uh, having something in their hands, that, or a gun that forces them to get what they want. If you disarm them, you need to equip them with another tool mm. that empowers them to think beyond their current circumstances. And so education yeah. and, and, and skills training for kids, whatever form of education it is, is, is very important. Young and this people. is this I would say then is your motivation behind a program that you are running, which I would like you to explain to us um, and tell us what is the impact because it's one thing many people are running sort of uh, projects within communities, but I'm not sure that people are talking enough about the impact of That's this true. project work that they are doing. So I would like you to tell us what is the project and what is the impact that we've had from this particular project. Thank you so much, Wanjiku. Um, I've been doing this uh, girls' ed advocacy work, education advocacy work, since 2006, even before then. But when I won the Miss Liberia pageant, I used my platform to champion education for young people and especially girls in rural communities. So we've worked with, with uh, I, I established a foundation called the Mata Jua Educational Foundation in honor of my mother. Uh, to advocate for scholarships and educational resources for girls and young people in rural Liberia. We've actually worked with over 200 young people across the country because, you know, we use our own resources so we don't have like a heavy a donor behind us funding, you know, our projects, but we use our own resources um, to help in whatever way we can. So we have mentorship initiatives, we have uh, coaching, we have, you know, like, events, seminars, workshops, career development conferences, and things like that to help young people. So we work with over 200. If you look at the impact, it has spread to over 200 to 500 young people. But with the girls, we've worked with, with over 200 girls, and we've provided scholarships and educational resources to, to over 25 girls in rural communities. Currently, we have a program called the Sexy Like a Book Initiative. Uh, and yes, and that was, it is a flagship program of the foundation. And it was launched to ignite and redefine what it means, uh, ignite a passion for literacy and education uh, uh, in young women. And to also re redefine what it means to be sexy. Uh, if you are a visionary, if you're a creative girl, you're an assertive girl, you are sexy. And boys as well, you can be sexy like a book. <laughs> you, <know? laughs> you had it, guys. You had it. Mm -hmm. You can be sexy just by reading. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now, I, I also know that you are an entrepreneur and you've run your organization or business for over eight years. What lessons did you learn that you think every young African entrepreneur must know? And you can summarize this in three tips of what every young entrepreneur must know. Young entrepreneurs think uh, um, we young entrepreneurs need to to take risks. 
as people always say, you know, instead of always dreaming, dreaming is good. And we always tell people, you know, have a dream, have a dream, but dream without action is nothing. So you have to be able to visualize where you see yourself and be sensitive to the opportunities around you. On the continent, a lot of young people are looking at, you know, external forces for inspiration, when actually most of the ideas, there are so many ideas and opportunities around uh, young people, you know, if only you have mm -hmm. the eye for it. So be, be, um, be curious to learn, have an eye for opportunity and, and not, not only dreams, but opportunities mm -hmm. and, and be willing to, to connect take, with the uh -huh. right people, take risks, uh -huh. connect with the right people and, and just uh, push, you know, push. Yeah. Just Push. So I'm going to push our conversation towards the end. <laughs> but uh, when I started our conversation, I said you wear many hats. I listed a couple of things only that you you have been involved in. Now, which one of these roles is, would you say, is the most important for you? Representing young people, the voices of, of girls and young people across the continent. Because, you know, young people have so much to offer. You know, young people have so much to offer as the, you know, the 77 percent theme depicts, you know, young people form. They are a great resource on the continent. And if they are harnessed and, and, and empowered, mm. they can change the narrative of the African continent. So I'm very passionate about the stories and experiences of girls, young girls and young people, young Africans, and telling that story from a place of strength that these are people who experience so many things on a daily basis, but they fight, they keep fighting. So poverty, like I said, is not the narrative of, of Africa and young Africans, but one of hope and promise. We can indeed create the type of, of continent we envisage. Hope and a promise. I particularly love those two words. Now, I just want to quickly speak to our YouTube watchers and let them know that if you want to continue this conversation, please make sure you comment your question in the comment section. But also, remember to subscribe because we have more incredible talks coming your way, yeah? So you don't want to miss on that. Click on that notification bell. Now, as we wrap up, Patrice, peace and hope is what you've said. I would like you to leave us with one recommendation of a book that you are either currently reading or you have read in the past that you thought, ah, oh, this book, everyone should read it. Just one book. And very quickly, why? How Nations Learn by the, the advisor uh, Okube. I think he's the, he's the advisor to the prime minister of, of uh, Ethiopia. How Nations Learn. It talks about how, you know, countries... In, in Asia and other parts of the world were able to catch up and how African, you know, the continent of Africa can tap into its, you know, great resources and opportunities to catch up with the rest of the, the developed world. Wow. I think it's a great resource that every African who is interested in Africa's future and development should read. How Nations Learn. Nations you had it. Learn. I will comment in the comment section about that particular book and, of course, about Patrice's poetry anthology. Thank you so much, Patrice, for joining us on our channel. It's always such a pleasure hearing from you. Thank you so much for having me and thanks to you and the DW team. I'm grateful. Thank you. And thank you for staying with us for this motivating and insightful conversation. Until goodbye. Until next time, <laughs> goodbye. <laughs>